It is my great pleasure as Dean of the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences to welcome you here today to this investiture ceremony recognizing the appointment of Robert Orsi as the Grace Craddock Nagel Chair in Catholic Studies. I am now pleased to introduce Professor Henry Beenan, who will describe the Nagel Chair and introduce the Duda family. I don't know whether Sarah demoted me or promoted me just now. Not sure. Um, well, yes. I am a professor. Well, let me give my own warm welcome to all of you and especially the Duda family. This, is, this chair is very close to my heart. Uh, Fritz and I talked about this chair for a long time, and I think it's really very important to the university, to our Department of Religion. I'm not sure we would have been able to recruit Bob Orsi here uh, without the distinguished chair that he deserves. And I always say that um, the greatest honor that we can bestow on a faculty person is an endowed chair. Uh, it's where faculty live. It's what we care about very much because it honors and recognizes the work uh, that someone has done to bring them to preeminence. So I am extremely grateful to the Duda family, Mary Lee and Fritz especially, but to the whole extended family, uh, which has supported Northwestern for a long time in many endeavors, despite a certain Notre Dame connection that's there. Uh, but also, children have come, come here, and uh, we're very proud of our connection to the Duda family. And I, for again, for a long time, we have wanted to really expand what we were able to do in Catholic studies here at the university. We think this is a very important area of both student life and intellectual pursuit. When we uh, were able to bring Professor Orsi here, we really thought we, uh, and we still think, that we brought the preeminent uh, scholar in the country in Catholic studies. So it's a great match between a person, a family, and the chair. And uh, I'm extremely pleased that um, the Duda family saw fit to support Northwestern and to honor us with their extreme generosity. And we promised, um, uh, Mary Lee and Fritz, we would find an absolutely excellent person for this chair, and I think we've been good to our promise by a long shot. So I would now um, like to um, call uh, Mary Lee Nagel Duda and Fritz Duda forward to receive the family medallion for what um, is the Grace, Natick, Crad Grace Craddock Nagel Chair in Catholic Studies, uh, and we would like to have you come forward if you both will. And uh, I ask Dean Mangelsdorf to also come forward again. I think she's going to do the honors for this medallion. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. And Mary Lee. Thank you. In gratitude to the Duda family. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, we actually usually put this around when we. It's going to be well, Mary Lee. Except, except since it says the Duda family, do you know which one to click around? I think. <laughs> I think you now introduce, now introduce yes. Go ahead. Okay. I'd now like to invite uh, Provost, also Professor, uh, Dan Linzer to introduce Professor Robert Orsi. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it was uh, April 2006, uh, when I was still serving as Dean of the Weinberg College, that I got a very excited email from the chair of the search committee, uh, who uh, is here today, Christy Trena, who uh, wrote me to say that in the, the search for the Nagel chair, um, they had just heard from Robert Orsi that he was interested in this position. And so she wrote me to uh, explain how exciting an opportunity this was. Um, and the, uh, the words that she used in that letter uh, were, if I may quote this, uh, he would bring all sorts of positive attention to the university and honor to the chair. 
So I didn't know what all sorts was, but I wanted to find out. So uh, we began to explore that. And lo and behold, uh, he does bring all sorts of uh, honor to this chair and to the university. Now, in making an endowed chair appointment, indeed in making any senior appointment, but especially an endowed chair appointment, uh, we don't only take the word of the department that's seeking to make such an appointment because these appointments are so important for the college and the university that you want to be sure that colleagues in other fields and other departments also see the impact that this person would have here at the university. Uh, so we were uh, quite eager to hear from colleagues outside of religion as well. And uh, Bob, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I, I did get a number of opinions based on your visit here, which followed shortly after that uh, email that I got from Christy. And there were such terms coming forward as immensely imaginative, smart and interesting, and precisely the type of interdisciplinary scholar we should add to our faculty. These are from people outside of the department. So uh, it, it was very exciting then to uh, meet with Bob and to uh, pursue this recruitment. Now, Bob comes to us after having uh, a good deal of academic experience at a number of institutions. He was a, an undergraduate at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, as he packed up his bags and graduated from Trinity, he moved all of a few miles down to New Haven to do his graduate work in religion at Yale University. And then immediately after uh, finishing his doctorate, or actually before you finished your doctorate, uh, joined Fordham University and the Lincoln Center campus in New York City. I guess you'd rather live in Manhattan than that on the island. And um, was a professor there in religious studies and taught there. While still an assistant professor, he won a prestigious Fulbright fellowship to uh, go and study and uh, do his work in Rome for a year. And then soon after that, moved to Indiana University uh, where his appointments gave evidence to the broad impact he would have were he to join us here at Northwestern because his faculty appointment was in four departments, um, religious studies, anthropology, American studies, and history. And that began Bob's lifelong uh, love of going to faculty meetings. <laughs> and so we were very pleased that, that he would um, contribute in many ways here because he also, while at Indiana, served as the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Curriculum in the College of Arts and Sciences and then as Chair of the Department of um, Religious Studies. In 2001, Bob was appointed as the Charles Warren Professor of American Religious History at Harvard Divinity School. And from 2004 until he moved here to Northwestern a year ago, he was the chair of the study of religion in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in Harvard College at, at Harvard uh, University. His work has been recognized with quite an array of honors and awards. He's won fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, he was named to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was elected as president of the American Academy of Religion for 2002-2003. You'll see in your program a list of his four books, each of, what, each of which has won major awards. I won't recite all of those to you now. You can take a look at them and then uh, purchase them later and then ask Bob to sign them. Um, one of the key factors, though, as Henry uh, alluded to in his comments, was that this was an opportunity to expand the curriculum in Catholic studies and to offer more to our students in an important field of study and engagement. And uh, one of the key factors then in recruiting Bob was his commitment to education, both undergraduate and graduate education. In his first year here, last year, uh, he taught four courses, two undergraduate and two graduate courses. I did look up his performance on the uh, course and teacher evaluation. Uh, it's a six-point scale. For overall instruction, Bob fell as low as 5.6 in those four courses. That was the worst of the four. But I also looked at the, the student comments, and 
Uh, and these courses range from some topics as religion, medicine, and suffering in the West uh, to the Catholic 60s to uh, advanced seminars for the graduate students. Uh, and I read through some of the student comments and I just want to share with you a couple to give a sense of Bob's impact. Uh, one from the introductory undergraduate course was, I love this class. It was so interesting and engaging. I want to take everything that Orsi teaches and I'm an engineer. <laughs> that was good. Um, uh, the, another class uh, had a different quote, which was, Orsi is an absolute powerhouse in the classroom, insightful, generous, funny, and always 100% engaging. So today it's our turn to be students in Bob's class, and we're going to get to learn his thoughts on the Catholic imaginary, Catholic studies in the university. Bob, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to Northwestern and to have this event for you to speak to the larger community. And now if uh, Sarah would join me again here, and Bob, if you would come up, uh, we'd like to hang something around your neck too. It is true. You have to give the talk wearing the medal, I swear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Okay. Our photographer would like you to step up and have a better, better picture. And if you face her, Well, my graduate students were wondering if I was going to wear a tie, and now, uh, thank you, Dan, for those really kind remarks. It's very hard, of course, to recognize oneself in these fabulous things that are said on such occasions, but it occurs to me that the people in, on these portraits around the room must have felt the same way when they looked at themselves in those portraits. So uh, I am humbled by the, the words that have been said, and I'm very grateful. Um, so let me say, first of all, how deeply honored uh, and very happy I am to be the first holder of the Grace Craddock Nagel Chair of Catholic Studies at Northwestern University. This afternoon, we celebrate uh, both the investiture of the Nagel Chair and the initiation, as several of the people introducing me have said, several, uh, the initiation of exciting new intellectual opportunities for teaching, research, and learning at Northwestern under the rubric of Catholic Studies. So this is a, a personally very fulfilling event, but also I think it's a great opportunity for Northwestern. Um, and I, I have to say, by the way, that I know the Duda family has connections to, uh, to uh, that other uh, institution of higher education close by in the Midwest, uh, Notre Dame. Uh, and I'm happy that several of my friends are here from Notre Dame, and I think that promises good uh, uh, cooperation uh, along these lines. Uh, I'm profoundly grateful, as all of Northwestern surely is, to the family of Grace Craddock Nagel, to Mary Lee Nagel Duda and Fritz Duda for making this possible, to Provost Dan Linzer, who is Dean of Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, gave the nascent plans for Catholic study the benefit, uh, in, uh, the benefit of his wisdom and guidance, to my colleagues in the religion department, Richard Kiekeffer and Christy Trena, who first raised the possibility of my coming to Northwestern as Nagel chair with me, and saw it through to fulfillment. Uh, Christy is the director of the new Catholic Studies program at, at Northwestern now. I'm also, I also want to express my thanks to John and Re Rosemary Krogan, who are not here, who offered me such a warm and gracious welcome back to the Midwest, and who made possible a second position in Catholic Studies held now by my colleague, who is here today, Professor Michelle Molina, a scholar of Catholicism in early modern Mexico. I also want to thank uh, President Henry Beenan for his vision of a truly international Catholic studies program. With the institution of the Nagel Chair, Northwestern joins the ranks of many other major universities in the United States to have endowed professorships in Catholic studies. Now, as exciting as this develop it, development is in American higher education, it is a relatively recent one. And while the lineaments of its history can be sketched out, as I hope to do briefly this afternoon, there was nothing inevitable or predictable about this development of chairs of Catholic studies around the country. 
Nor was there anything inevitable or predictable about my, beco my becoming a professor of Catholic studies. As I thought about what I wanted to say tonight, the memory of going to confession as a boy on Saturday afternoons in the Bronx kept intruding <laughs> on me and demanding my attention. It was on Saturday afternoons that quote, armies of children, in the exasperated phrase of one parish priest in mid-century, trooped into the curtained boxes of the confessional to whisper the small offenses that they had carefully enumerated and memorized. Trapped in hot, cramped spaces, dying for a cup of co coffee and then for a drink as the day ground endlessly on, their heads bent at an angle like Christ on the cross to hear the tiny voices coming just from below the sill of the shuttered window separating priest from penitent. This was purgatory for generations of American Catholic clergy. <laughs> but it was a source of great relief to me. I skipped merrily out of church on Saturday afternoons back onto the Bronx streets, cleaned of sin and completely prepared for a city bus to run me down. <laughs> I had a rosary in my pocket, as the nuns had told me to do, so my body would be identified as Catholic and taken to the right funeral home. <laughs> God forbid Protestants got their untrustworthy hands even on my corpse, <laughs> although this was the most abstract and remote possibility because as far as I knew, there were no Protestants in the Bronx, <laughs> perhaps not in all of New York City, and I was doubtful actually about the rest of the United States too, for that matter since I had never actually met a Protestant and thought of them like dinosaurs, creatures who were once powerful and ruled the earth, but were now extinct. <laughs> Yale University turned out to be my own Jurassic Park. <laughs> I was secure in the knowledge that with the black marks just erased from my milk bottle soul, I was headed straight to heaven, as I had been promised in my catechism class. This was a sweet, albeit fragile, feeling. Now my Catholic unconsciousness was telling me I needed to give some account of myself this afternoon and of my intellectual and academic journey. So this is the autobiographical prologue to the history I want to explore with you. When in the year of the nation's bicentennial, which was also 445 years since the Virgin of Guadalupe appeared to a man named Juan Diego on a Mexican hillside. When in that year I got to Yale University to study Catholics in American history, I discovered that even for my major professor, the distinguished historian Sidney Alstrom, whom I admired and loved and who had found a place in his capacious religious history of the American people, for almost everyone, uh, this is why I went to Yale in the first place, Catholics and Catholicism, while definitely included, stood off to one side of the main narrative, like long absent and barely recognized relatives at a wedding. The official religious history of the nation began with the coming of the Puritans in 1630, with their dramatic sense of sin and redemption and of God's special providence for them, and it continued with their movement westward across the continent. But where in this story was Father Jacques Marquette, who explored the Mississippi River and proposed renaming it the River of the Immaculate Conception. Think how different, by the way, the shape. <laughs> think how different the shape of American civilization would have been if Huck and Jim had, <laughs> had made their way down the old Immaculate. Where were Padre Junipero Serra and the Franciscans in California, wherever the Puritans and their descendants hauled up in the American past and then in the narrative of American religious history, Catholics were already there. Who were these people anxiously watching the newcomers arrive? These figures made brief appearances in Alstrom's narrative, but they seem to have wandered in from some other history, maybe Mexico's, maybe Canada's. And then they disappear again as the great folk song of American history rolls on around them from the rocky shores of New England to, to the Pacific Coastal Highway. This land evidently was made for them, but not for us. This impulse to exclusion, however, cuts both ways. It was not only Protestants who wanted to lay claim to the American past, as my comment about Jurassic Park suggests. Compared to the Catholic part in the history of America, Catholic diplomat Maurice Francis Egan wrote at the end of the 19th century, compared to the Catholic part in the history of America, 
the coming of the Mayflower was but an episode. Take that. I imagine a John Stewart-esque like mugging here. Catholics aspired to take hold of the national myth too. During the uh, national centennial year in 1876, the great American Catholic historian John Gilmer, Gil Gilmary Shea offered the Catholic version of the American folk song. Quote, the first explorers of our coast were Catholic and when they landed, they planted the symbol of the cross and so studded their maps with names from the church calendar that we can trace their course by them. I'm still quoting uh, Shea. The lapse of years, the vicissitudes of war, the incoming settlers with their new learned views, he's referring to Protestants, of course, have not effaced them. When America took her rank among the nations, she claimed as her bounds the river of the Holy Cross and the river of St. Mary. It was in the same interior from St. Regis to the western river of St. Joseph and the rapids of Sault Ste. Marie. Catholicity had recorded her early presence as discoverer and explorer on the soil of the Republic, and each accession of territory brought in new proofs of Catholic discovery, exploration, and settlement. St. Augustine on the south, St. Louis on the west, and beyond the city of the Holy Faith, Santa Fe, and San Francisco, as in a medieval painting amid a group of saints. But neither version of the American Catholic story seemed right to me. I knew this before I got to New Haven. I wanted to study Catholics as makers of American history and culture, as much as American Catholicism has been shaped by the circumstances of life in the United States too. American religious history is about people's struggles to contend with and to make sense of the uh, struggles and challenges of modern life in the United States, which were always very hard, if sometimes exciting and liberating too. To do this, they drew on the practices and understandings offered by their religious traditions, which they inherited and improvised, and which they wanted their children to share as well. In this powerful encounter with the realities of American life, the religions of the different peoples in the United States were made and remade over and over again, as was American life itself. Catholics were in the mix from the start, working and living alongside other people speaking other languages with different skin color remembering other places and times and praying to other gods. This is how I, I see the drama of American religious history and this is uh, how I wanted to study it. So I called myself an American religious historian and not a Catholic historian. But where did a Catholic boy from an immigrant working, Italian working class family in the Bronx find the chutzpah, to borrow a word from my Bronx neighbors, to call himself an American religious historian? It must have been from the Catholic school since I, until I went off to college, this was the only intellectual environment I knew. The nuns teaching in parochial schools between the 1930s and the 1970s were the best educated and best prepared nuns in American Catholic history. And there was probably no better high school education at the time than what the Jesuits offered me at Fordham Prep uh, and offered other boys like me from homes like mine. It was in the care of the Jesuits that I first read theology, history, and literature. I studied French, Greek, and Latin, uh, and I learned how to drink Chivas Regal. <laughs> Catholic youngsters were going off to college and, and graduate school in ever greater numbers in the 1960s, excuse me, in 1970s, most of them to non-Catholic schools. I want to pause here for just a quick second about the phrase non-Catholic. Um, I'm always uncomfortable with that because it implies that there are only two alternatives, Catholics and non-Catholic. Um, furthermore, many of the places uh, in the United States, many schools in the United States quickly acquired very large Catholic populations, so it doesn't really make sense to call them non-Catholic, actually. But that's the term that everybody uses, so I'm going to use it too. So Catholics began going to non-Catholic schools in the 1960s and 70s. By the time I got to college in 1971 and graduate school in 1976, both of them non-Catholic, I found myself in the company of hundreds of thousands of other Catholic young men and women. The number of, this is an extraordinary statistic, the number of Catholics attending college rose from 7% of the Catholic population in 1940, 7% in 1940 to 32% by 1970 and still rising. By this later date, historian Charles Morris writes, Catholics were, quote, indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the national average on measures of education and occupational status and had considerable advantage in income. By the 70s, Catholics were as educated as other Americans. They were wealthier than most other American groups. 
Um, it was, it's an extraordinary 40-year period in American Catholic history. So we were in the mix, as I said. I do not remember any of my Catholic friends in college or graduate school being particularly shy or ill at ease in these environments. By this time in history, academic confidence was being bred in the American Catholic bone. But the great irony, and here's my main point of the afternoon, the great irony of the arrival of Catholics in American colleges and universities after World War II was that while Catholics were becoming ever more confidently present in American universities, Catholic reality and realities remained absent from the dominant ac academic and intellectual culture of the time. So there's a disconnection here, and it's discon this disconnection that I want to explore the disconnection between so many Catholics pouring into uh, non-Catholic universities and the absence of Catholic, what I'm calling, it's cumbersome, but it's the best I can do, Catholic reality and realities. Those are missing. By Catholic realities and reality, I mean both the distinctive way that Catholics looked at, imagined, and understood the world and the things they did about it. So those were kind of missing. Those were missing from the university. So I did not find anything resembling what I had known in the Bronx and what was being called religion, religious studies, or religious history in college and graduate school. Religion was understood in American universities at the time on the model of liberal American Protestantism. The focus was almost exclusively on intellectual inheritances, a lineage Catholics drop out of after Aquinas, uh, and on universal ethical norms. I remember being asked to read a book in sociology class at one point which argued that Southern Italians, which I am half of, half of me is Southern Italian, Southern Italians acted in the world not on the basis of reasoned and abstract principles of universal application, like modern people are said to do, <laughs> but out of family loyalty. You've all seen The Godfather. This is succinctly put in the phrase, never go against the family. The author called this, less, less elegantly, amoral familism. <laughs> amoral familism. He means never go against the family. But I could never quite understand, much to one of my professor's utter frustration at Yale, I mean, I reduced him virtually to tears at one point, I could never understand why family loyalty, which I knew from personal experience, got extended in all sorts of ways to embrace all kinds of people and places outside the home. Why wasn't this a valid foundation for social and political responsibility? Embodied religious practices, such as the things that Catholics do, had other names in religious scholarship at that time. They were called cults, magic, superstition, and so on. And they were understood to be lower forms of religious life, um, except in their most highly sublimated, symbolic, and choreographed forms. Such higher instances of ritual practice did not include the practice of awkwardly bending over on Good Friday to kiss the graphically painted wounds on a statue of Jesus' body affixed to a giant cross, as I had watched everybody in my parish do every year or throwing burnt palms saved up from Palm Sunday uh, into the winds of an oncoming storm, a practice common among rural Catholics uh, into the 1970s. How taken for granted this way of thinking about religion had become, this liberal, normative, liberal Protestant way of thinking about religion, how, normative, how, how widespread and normative this had become by the 1960s is evident in the era's popular and enormously influential psychological models of individual religious development understood in terms of a graded hierarchy of ascending stages of faith that go from one at the lowest end to five at the highest end. The lower end in such schema are characterized by the tendency to approach the sacred in anthropomorphic and highly personal terms, by the stress on authority and obedience, if not on subservience, and by a face-to-face -face as opposed to a universalizing sense of right and wrong. You see where this is going. Um, the highest a Catholic could get in such models was about level 2.75. <laughs> Religious stage theory always makes me imagine a New Yorker cartoon of evolutionary development with my Sicilian grandmother in her black dress and gold cross stepping up onto a New York sidewalk and morphing into a Quaker or a Unitarian. 
Dominant assumptions across the disciplines designated Catholic forms of religious practice and imagination pre-modern and primitive uh, when it took note of them at all. The latter term primitive is evidence of a racist subtext in this view of what religion is or what good and modern religion is that goes back to the early modern period. It found subsequent endorsement in the, in, in the identification of Irish and Africans in British colonial and domestic policies and in American racism. In American religious sociology and history, Catholic immigrants and African Americans alike were designated as childish, overly emotional, feminized, and out of step with the modern world. This cultural obtuseness ranged, reigned unchallenged when I arrived at school in the 1970s. The situation was not much different at Catholic colleges and universities at the time either. An old and reputable Jesuit scholar at the Catholic University where I held my first teaching position vetoed a grant proposal I made in 1983 to do field work actually here in Chicago on uh, Catholic devotions with the angry and unintentionally racist complaint, quote, he wants to study us as if we were Africans. Catholic scholars of Catholicism in the United States at the time were especially anxious in the 1970s and 1980s to maintain the same normative hierarchy of religion I have described, but for their own reasons. The tendentious stages of faith paradigm was highly influential among Catholic educators, determined as they were to raise their fellow churchgoers to stages at least three and a half, if not four. This meant not only getting rid of everything having to do with the earlier stages, statues, particularly little statues of Jesus dressed in brocaded and sequined gowns, lovingly sewn by parish women, memorized prayer, blessed oils and holy waters, and in fact anything that dripped or onto clothing or that you could kiss or put into your mouth, all of that <laughs> had to be done away with if Catholics were ever gonna make it up beyond stage 2.75. It also meant absolutely denying any connection to such things and practices, even in the past, even or especially if, one, if one's mother had actually done the sewing or the kissing. Ever since the 1970s, there has been the apprehension in American Catholic intellectual culture that merely to study Catholic ways of being in the world and of relating to the saints and Mary that were widespread before the reforms mandated by the Second Vatican Council threatened to revive them, as if history were a form of uh, necromancy. Some Catholics became terrified of ghosts. Of, uh, it was as if, uh, in fact, uh, uh, when I was working on my book on St. Jude, a very famous liturgist who I was having dinner with one night in New York City said, he got very angry with me, and he said, you're threatening to bring back everything we did so hard, we worked so hard to get rid of. And I said, I'm. I'm a historian, I'm studying the past. I have no intention of bringing it back. Other Catholics at the time mourned the past and aspired to bring back, they did aspire to bring back practices like the Latin Mass or Tuesday Benediction that they had felt had been abandoned and betrayed. All of this, both the fear of the past and the desire to revive the past, worked to push actual Catholic practice and imagination, what I have called Catholic reality and realities, uh, in its lived historicity deeper into the path, in, deeper into the historical and theoretical shadows, especially even in or especially in Catholic universities. But the absence of Catholic reality and realities was becoming more obvious and stressful now because there were so many Catholics in the university asking their questions, drawing on their distinctive experiences and memories, um, wondering about how their parents and grandparents fit into history and not being silent about these things. Younger Catholics in the 1970s were not as petrified, furthermore, about the immediate Catholic past and about religious practices that their elders found so shameful and threatening or were so nostalgic for. In the 1970s, a perfect cultural storm was brewing in higher education that would make possible a new kind of Catholic scholarship. Demography, new populations coming into the academy, academic reorientation, an openness to formally denied or excluded ways of being in and understanding the world, and a more confident and open sensibility among younger Catholics created an environment in which the disjuncture that I talked about a moment ago, the disjuncture between the presence of Catholics in the university and the absence of Catholic reality and realities from intellectual and academic culture could become the productive ground 
of theoretical reflection. That's what began to happen in the 1970s. That split between absent Catholic reality and realities and present Catholics in the classrooms asking their questions, bringing in their memories, began this new epoch, I think, in the study of Catholicism in the United States. The great historian of higher education in the United States, Catholic higher education, Notre Dame's Philip Gleason, calls this era, the 1970s, the time when Catholics, quote, accepted modernity. And I agree with the addendum that this was modernity as refracted through the Catholic imaginary. This is the space of Catholic studies. Let me specify briefly what I mean by Catholic reality and realities being absent from the practices of academic inquiry. One example of this is the case of the missing Catholic, as I, as I described before, like Father Marquette, Padre Sierra, and others. But I use the phrase Catholic reality and realities to signal a more radical and consequential absence than missing figures on the historical landscape. If this were all there were to it, if it was just a question of missing priests or missing nuns, um, missing Catholics in the American past, the solution would have been very simple, just put them back in, or just put them in. But this is not all I mean. The best analogy to where I'm heading here is women's history, which developed actually at the same time in higher education, as did also African American history and Chicano studies and so forth, and likewise reflected change demographic realities. To approach the past with women in view, feminist historians argued, is not simply a matter of finding women where they had been overlooked, although this was an important activity, an important step in the process. Rather, it meant to ask again what mattered about the past. This involved challenging what had been taken for granted about human experience and relationships in the past and what had been deemed really real to people. It meant querying how the world worked, what the real was, and what it means to be a person. Women's history was a more searching and fundamental project than simply finding a place for women in the familiar story. They proposed changing the story itself. And this, I think, is what Catholic Studies is about, too. Like the air that follows a person into a room from the outside on a cold day, new memories and previously unfamiliar life histories swept into American higher education with the arrival of so many Catholics in the 1970s and 1980s. They came, we came with assumptions more or less consciously held about the world and its ways that had been formed in Catholic parishes and schools uh, uh, and in working class homes with, uh, with holy water fonts in the bedroom and rosaries in their grandmother's aprons. Catholic youngsters who went off to college in the decades after the Second World War had grown up with, probable, with stories of improbable encounters between heaven and earth that had just taken place not that many years before in Italy, Ireland, or Poland, wherever their grandparents or parents were from. The supernatural in the Catholic imagination leans very close to the natural. The Virgin Mary appeared in these stories to enlist children in her efforts to protect the modern world from destruction, a holy man bled from his wounds, and, uh, the wounds in his body uh, like Christ, and Catholics suffered horribly in defense of their faith at the hands of Russian and Chinese communists. On the walls of our homes and churches were images of holy figures with broken bodies and sores. The moral of these stories was that Catholics had a special ability to endure pain on behalf of their religious and political beliefs well beyond the capacity of other Americans. This was part of our confidence too. Many of us had yearned as children to have a vision of the Virgin Mary. I know I did. And some of us actually did have visions of the Virgin Mary, like little Joe Vitolo, uh, who saw the Blessed Mother standing on his grandmother's backyard fence on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx uh, in 1948, and actually a famous but uh, little known apparition. It never quite made it to the level of Lourdes. Um, we made a space at our desks for our guardian angels. Uh, the nuns had drilled into the young men and women who went off to college in the 1970s and the 1980s that God was really, literally present in the communion host, which is why they could not touch it with their teeth. I, I'm, uh, I've been doing research on growing up Catholic in the 20th century, and when I talk about the host to people all over the United States, the first thing they say was how the nuns had told them, don't touch it with your teeth, don't bite on the host with your teeth, keep it away. Um, and that was because of this real, it was really God. God was really there. This was, God was really present. Whether um, we believed it or not, those of us going off to college in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, this was actually pressed deep into our imaginations and into our bodies. 
and we brought this with us into, into, into our philosophy classes, into our psychology classes, and into our political science classes. Um, the Catholic newcomers to the university all br also brought with them to college and university their grandparents and parents' memories of mines and factories, farms and migrant camps, because U.S. Catholicism until 1960 was actually U.S. Catholic men until 1960 were still majority blue-collar workers. The few men in my neighborhood who made it to corporate Manhattan told stories when they were back in the Bronx at night and had had enough to drink, uh, and they always had enough to drink about the condescending and superior executives and supervisors who lorded it over them every day in Manhattan. Uh, the generation that went off to college in the 19th centuries brought these memories too, and this sorrow with them into the academy when they came into the academy. Um, and if you think about some of the great figures of American Catholic culture who are so important to the generation of the 70s and the 80s, from George Carlin to Pat Buchanan to Phyllis Schlafly, do you see any commonalities among these people? <laughs> Pat Buchanan, Phyllis Shafley, George Carlin, Dan Berrigan. There's something about their passion and their imaginations and the way they're citizens that's very distinctive and that draws very deeply from the roots of American Catholic experience that they brought with them into the university in these years. These memories and inheritances and experiences are the ground of what I'm calling the Catholic imaginary. And the Catholic imaginary is basic to how I understand the contribution of Catholic studies to the work of the university. The intertwined histories I've been tracing, and I'm coming here to the end, the intertwined histories I've been tracing, my own, the story of my own coming to Yale, and the history of the movement of Catholics into the university um, at the precise moment when American higher education itself was undergoing radical change. Um, this is a kind of, that, that History is a kind of, is a template, is a narrative version of the theoretical point I want to make. And the theoretical point I want to make is this, that the contribution of Catholic studies to the academy comes from bringing modern critical inquiry and the Catholic imaginary into reflective and conscious engagement with each other, turning the demographic transformation of the 1970s into an intentional theoretical program for the present. So a double movement is involved here. On first, the critical and empirical examination of how Catholics actually live using anthropology, history, literary studies, and so forth. And that's part of what Catholic studies does too, of course. We study how Catholics live, what Catholics do, what Catholics believe. So that's part one, the empirical, critically informed study of Catholics and, uh, and Catholicism and how it's changed over time. Second, is the reformulation of what has been discovered in this way about the Catholic imaginary into theoretical challenges and possibilities for further research. Thus, Catholicism is studied in its manifold lived specificity on the one hand, and the study of Catholicism raises theoretical problems that challenge the assumed limits of knowledge in the modern academy and open new directions for research and theory. I'm going to close with two concrete examples of what I mean here. Catholics, of course, have bring, and they still do, but they, most of them did, they, everybody did before the 1960s, now many do. Catholics bring holy objects, things, statues, liquids, and so forth, into the spaces of modern medicine. The effect of this is often disruptive. These objects may interfere with hospital protocols, um, I knew someone once who was suffering horribly from uh, leukemia who tried to bring a vial of sacred dirt from a shrine in New Mexico into the, the um, special ward in the hospital, the quarantine, what's that ward called? Uh, the ward in the hospital where you have to wear masks and gowns to come in. Um, hmm? the intensive care, but it's a very, very high, they wouldn't, doctors went crazy, they wouldn't let this in, and it was a very interesting clash. And what they finally decided to do is they taped the vial to the outside of the window so that she could see the vial, but it wasn't, it wasn't contaminating uh, the room. So these, obviously, this is a very interesting story, that's a very interesting story about modern medicine and about the intersection between one kind of imagination and the world of modern medicine. Um, as I say, these objects may interfere with hospital protocols, disturb other patients, confuse categories, blur boundaries. 
What does this striking intersection teach us about the construction of modern medical reality and its limitations? Do we have adequate theoretical terminology in the study of material culture, for example, to understand the meanings and purpose of sacred objects in this particular setting? What is a thing? To ask a typical professorial question. What is a thing? Well, you know, Catholics have something to say about that. And what Catholics have to say about that and how Catholic, what Catholics have done with things raises some very interesting questions in general about things, which can then be used to raise more questions about things. Second, Catholics around the world seek physical healing at replicas of shrines. There was one in the Bronx. Uh, the replicas of the shrine at Lourdes, for example, where the Virgin Mary appeared as the Immaculate Conception in 1858. When the Virgin Mary appeared, for those of you who don't know this story, she pointed to the ground and a spring of water appeared and that's the basis of the healing water at Lourdes. But what's a replica of a healing site? What does it mean that in the Bronx, which had no connection with Lourdes as far as I could tell, <laughs> and where a spring of water came from the, from the city reservoir, and they the priest turned it on in the morning and the water flowed and at night the priest turned it off and the water stopped. So it was just water. Yet, if you go to this place in the Bronx, there are lines uh, of, of people uh, uh, showing up to get that water, to put in their cars, and to bathe their sick, and to drink, and so forth. What is this? What's a replica of a holy site? You know, Walter Benjamin struggled with this. What's a replica? What does that mean? Does cultural geography, as we have it in the university right now, possess adequate theoretical terminology? to explore the global network of miraculous healings that spreads outward from a particular point? Or does that require that we rethink certain key categories of cultural geography? What kind of geography is this, anyway? What can we take from the study of the Catholic imaginary in evidence at Lourdes for comparative research on other globally dispersed and interconnected networks of religious power? such as the coordinated webs of finance and doctrine that reach out across Asia from restored Taoist temples uh, on the Chinese mainland, or the, uh, or the circulation of cassettes of recorded prayers by famous imams. Catholics, the study of Catholicism raises questions that opens theoretical possibilities for the comparative study of these other worlds too. And I think that's the contribution of Catholic studies to the university. So the work of framing such questions for further research in the humanities and social sciences, for comparative study, and for theoretical elaboration, tracking back and forth between the Catholic world and modern traditions of knowledge is exactly how I see the task of Catholic studies in the university and its promise. Thank you. Thanks for that great talk, Bob. I can see why you get such great student valuations. I'd love to take one of your classes. Um, and if you don't mind, I bet after that talk, there are some people here who'd like to ask you some questions. So we'll take some questions now. Thank you. Well, too much of what you said really resonated uh, with me and my own work. And I'm, I'm still thinking about that remark you made about disembodied religious practices. I do. I think this needs to be. Um, the question is, uh, is Catholicism itself uh, undergoing change so that as Catholicism becomes more modern, are its practices, are, are Catholics in fact moving up the stages of faith as has been established by other people? And I think yes and no. I mean, I think that these inheritances, one of the things I have found, I, my, my, my metaphor for the, my, the, when I, I've been working, as, you, as I've said, on growing up Catholic in the 20th century, and I spoke to one person, I've, sp I've spoken to many people who abandoned their Catholicism, and they made the leap to the modern world as they explicitly saw it. But one woman told me a very powerful story, and this has been for me a guiding kind of theoretical touchstone. 
she said that she had a, she was an ex-nun actually, and, and she was now in her 70s, but she said that when she was a young woman, she'd left the church, she'd left the convent, she was, you know, she had had it, and she wanted a more modern way of being religious. She was done with the oils, done with memorized prayer, which she was really angry about. Uh, you know, that's a bad thing, memorized prayer, no more memorized prayer. Um, she was angry at memorized prayer, so she had rejected that whole world. And then one day, she was working as a social worker in Gary, Indiana, and she found herself in the middle of a race riot. And she said at that moment, she said she began saying Hail Marys, although she felt, as she put it, that she wasn't saying Hail Marys, but that the Hail Marys was saying her. And I thought, okay, well, something's going on here, something about the deep imaginative, the deep embodiment of certain ways of being in the world that are not simply erased in a generation or two, um, that actually they endure in one way or another. Um, and, you know, Catholicism is a global culture. Different, different parts of the Catholic world have very different experiences of all this. Um, American Catholicism has been profoundly uh, influenced by Mexican Catholicism, for example, which has come in the last 180 years that Mexican Catholicism has been moving through the United States, uh, that's also bringing other ways of, so, of, of being Catholic and keeping other ways of being Catholic in the mix. So I, no, I don't think they're simply passing, but I do think it raises questions about historical memory and, and where, where that memory is and so forth. my personal journey? Uh, well, I think, I, I think that story about the former nun and Gary moved me so deeply because I think to some extent that is my uh, journey also. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I actually, I, I never let my students ask that question, but you're not my students, and so um, I take it as a fair question. Um, you know, I certainly, ha I, I certainly went through the fire bay. I was at, I was at the, ep I was at ground zero of the 60s. I went to a Jesuit high school in New York City, as I said. It was rumored, although I never saw him, that Dan Berrigan used, uh, used my high school as a, um, a safe house when he was hiding out from the FBI. So there would be these sightings of Dan Berrigan in the locker room that actually I, I never had. <laughs> but it was said that he was there. So I was right in the mix of the modernizing of Catholicism in the 1960s and 1970s, and of course it affected me. Um, but I think now I've come through all that, and maybe my work as a historian reflects this, that I deeply cherish the culture that I was raised in. Uh, I have a very, I, it's, it's a very much a part of me, and I acknowledge that. And I can't really imagine, not simply my, my inner life, but you know, my ex, the way I am in the world is profoundly affected by that, and that's still a very important part of me. Sarah, my, my other beloved colleague in Catholic Studies. I don't know enough about that empirically. You know, I have to say, I think it's a, I mean, I have to say it's a rich ground for further study. Um, I, one of my students at Indiana did her dissertation on, uh, you know her, uh, did her dissertation on contemporary American paganism, and she asked me if I would go to a pagan festival with her at one point in the, in the 1980s. Um, and I did, I did. I was a good mentor, and I, I did. I went, um, which is a whole other set of stories, some of which I've written about. But I was really struck by the very Catholic uh, the feel that I got walking around that. I mean, because it was all about things and oils and, and incenses and smells and so forth. 
and there I think it might be, you know, so much of the modern world itself is constituted by this division between presence and absence, what's there and what's not there. Um, I tell my students about, you know, what happens if my grandmother were to go to the Metropolitan Museum of New York and, and see a statue of the Virgin Mary, my grandmother would have wanted to kiss that statue or touch that statue because, because um, there, as far as she was concerned, something was there that wasn't just a statue. But the guard would come over and remove my grandmother for touching that statue because in the modern world that's not acceptable. So that tension between what's there and what's not there runs right through modernity, I think. Um, uh, it doesn't completely grid Catholic Protestant, as Christine, who's left, uh, my wife, from whom I learned many, many things. Um, Christine would tell me Lutherans have real presence too, and, uh, and that Catholics only say they have real presence, but Lutherans also have it. But be that as it may, that split between presence and absence goes through modern history. And so very often when people want to protest the modern world, it not surprisingly takes Catholic forms. such transitions at Yale at the time of uh, going from all men to co-ed, going from wearing a jacket and tie to dinner to not. Um, it, it was a, a radicalization of things. And so Catholicism may have been more um, susceptible to that dissonance of questioning tradition and authority, not just whether things were than some other religions that were more compatible with um, questioning authority. And so is that a source of this tension as well, do you think? The, the 60s and 70s were tremendously convulsive times for Catholics, but their experience was not identical to the rest of the culture's experience, even though it happened at the same time. Um, Catholic, Catholics were going through their own experience, and so while um, you're absolutely right that the challenge, of, the challenge to authority was real, Catholics were struggling, this is, this is the subject of my course, the Catholic Sisties, Catholics were struggling with authority. They were battling authority in some ways. They didn't just throw over authority, they were caught in this, I mean, for them it was a question of working out these things. And then you had the inherited memories that I'm talking about, which are, I think, very important. The Catholic experience of the 60s and 70s is a distinct and powerful moment of American culture. Um, yeah. And I think we see it all over the place. I mean, I think it does have an impact. I mean, I'm, I wasn't kidding. I mean, um, Barry Goldwater's Conscience of a Conservative, for example, his famous manifesto was actually written by a Catholic. Um, he was written by Bill Buckley's brother-in-law, Brent Bozell. Um, Nixon's speeches and Reagan's speeches were written by Catholics. I mean, there's this odd connection there where Catholics who struggle with authority, they're, 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 they're trying to figure out their relationship to authority, are at the same time, they're contributing in this, they move into and they start contributing to American, mainstream American culture in very interesting and important ways at this point. Um, so, so the answer is that it wasn't simply a revolt against authority for Catholics. Um, one of the books I have students read in the Catholic 60s class is called The Old Yet New Mass, in which the point of the old yet new mass is that as changed as things are, and how much more changed could it be than the English mass, as changed as things are, this is really the old mass. We're really, we're becoming more faithful to tradition. And the great Catholic scholar John O'Malley says that's how Catholics talk about radical change. They talk about radical change as going back to an authenticity. So that was a lot of the language of Catholic rebellion in the 60s was the language of change, but it was this oddly inflected language of we're radical and we're going to do what they did in the second century. <laughs> so I don't know if that makes sense. They were battling a different authority. Maybe one more.
Well, you know, it's funny. I was actually asked a very similar question about specialness at Notre Dame just a few months ago. And I've been really struggling with this question since. Um, and just this morning, I finished writing the article that's in response to the question, is this special? I think if we can say that Catholics were distinct without necessarily saying that they were better, I mean, it always sounds like I'm saying they were somehow special. I'm just saying that they were different and that their, and that their particular root, the roots, the roots of their citizenship and the roots of their engagement with science and the roots of their, you know, an interesting figure, you want an, an example, the birth control pill, of course, was invented by a Catholic doctor, um, John Rock, who thought, if you read, there's been a fabulous biography of him, if you read that biography, he thought he was doing just what a Catholic should be doing um, by inventing that pill. So there, his Catholic imaginary there was hard at work. And he saw, it, he saw his science through that lens. It didn't work out that way for him, um, but, uh, but, but that's how he originally saw it. So yeah, I mean, I think we could go through a whole host of areas. And again, I'm not, at Notre Dame, I was accused of bringing back Catholic exceptionalism. Um, and you can't imagine how much that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm not trying to do that. What I'm saying, however, is that, is that you simply can't equate, if we're gonna take seriously the notion that people approach the world in particular ways that are grounded in their culture, their tradition, their histories, their experiences, their memories, their endowments, and so forth, their bodily, then we're going to have to say, well, Catholics had a, had a very different culture, and they were approaching this in a very different way, and they brought very different sets of questions and assumptions to science, to the study of the Bible, to all these other things. Um, so yes, I think, I actually think, and, he, and again, I'm uncomfortable saying this because it sounds like I'm saying there was such a thing as a Catholic science. I'm not saying that. I'm trying to say that there was a that Catholics approached the questions of science standing in a particular place. They brought particular lenses. You could use the metaphor of the lens. They brought particular lenses to this. And those lenses shaped their questions and their discoveries. I know we said no more questions, but that was going to be our last one, but Henry. Yes, it's hard to refuse. It's hard to refuse the president. Well, uh, and, this, and this question could set you off on another talk, <laughs> which would be fine with me, because it's such a rich talk. But from your own you know, snippets of what you've said, you've talked about uh, kind of uh, uh, Mexican immigrants who have come in in such a large number with their own traditions. Uh, if you look at the streams of American immigrant life, Irish, Italian, Latino, Central European, um, and then you lay on, layer onto that this huge transformation of social status, political power, moving from some relatively not very large share of population to a quite large share of American population. And you, you touched on some of, but not all of these things. You talked about this wave of people who came into the universities. One could look at social mobility, occupational mobility, income you referred to. So with these vast changes of, of immigrant streams and of social change, geographic change as people moved all over from cities to suburbs, yet you still hold on to a, a, a singularity that you've talked about, even the Catholic, and this or that. And I'm wondering how to rub that up against these vast social, economic, and immigrant strains which have um, affected so much of American life and surely must have had both a theological impact as well as a vast cultural impact. I really think, I mean, that's a fabulous question, and we can't, we can't talk about that a long time. The short answer, however, is um, Catholic schools. I mean, we can't forget the fact, Sarah probably knows the figures better than I, but I, I'm trying to remember, there's an astonishing statistic about how many American Catholic nuns were teaching Catholic children as late as 1965. I mean, we're talking several hundred thousand women involved in the education of Catholic children. Catholic education was a vast machine for the formation of these minds and bodies. It was, it was a tremendous enterprise. And I think that in 1884, the bishops gathered in, in, uh, in Baltimore for their third plenary council in the United States. 
they actually considered, and then they backed off at the last minute, in part because there was some pressure from Rome to do so, because I think Rome saw what, the, what would have happened. But they, the bishops were going to make it a mortal sin, which meant hell, if you died in that state, a mortal sin not to send your children to Catholic school, which would have been, I mean, that would have been an extraordinary moment in human history um, um, if they had done that. They, they couldn't do it, um, so they backed off that. But through the 20th century, um, it, there was tremendous pressure to send your children to Catholic school, and that became the foundation. So all these people who, I mean, again, I've spoken to hundreds of Catholics about their childhoods, most of whom have gone on to secular lives, all of whom were deeply marked in positive, negative, but whatever ways by that. And I think that has to be in this picture somehow. Um, that and Catholic, which involves, by the way, Catholic liturgical life, because these little kids, the, the Catholics prided themselves. They pointed to Protestants and they said, you know, Protestants have Sunday school where they are like making believe, they make coloring Noah's Ark, whatever. Um, <laughs> Catholics are telling these little kids that they're giving these little kids the real thing, which is true. Little kids, for example, as all the Catholics in the room over a certain age know, little kids had to fast. They didn't even get a break on fasting. So one of the great stories of Catholic childhood is of people fainting at little kids fainting at mass because they haven't eaten since midnight the night before. But there was no, in other words, there was no quarter given to little kids in their formation in the church. And I can't think of any other religious group in the United States, and I have thought long and hard about this, and, and not the Mormons, who rely for the most part on public education, not Jews, because I don't think ever it reached 50% of the Jewish population that went to uh, Jewish schools. Hmm? Um, and in some places in Catholics, it was more than 50%. No particular Protestant denomination ever achieved that level of educational focus that Catholics did between the years, I would say, it, 1915 and 1975, when this was just this vast engine. I think we'll break now, but um, we're going to have a reception at the back of the room, and I'm sure many of you may want to bring your additional questions to Bob in that informal setting. Please stay and enjoy the reception. Thank you very much. Can I take it off now? No, I should leave it.